Hi! This week I'll be wrapping up my series on the strongest arguments for atheism. There are a bunch that just weren't strong enough to make the list, so check the video description. I put a few of the more common weak atheist arguments there, as well as my assessment of the strength of the atheist cause as a whole. Thanks, and I'll see you next season. Hey, welcome back to Clean Cut, where we can talk about the truth about just about anything, as long as we use logic and common sense. Finally, the last arguments I'll address for now are the arguments made by famous atheists of the past. I'll spend a few moments refuting them each in turn. The philosopher has never killed any priests, whereas the priest has killed a great many philosophers. Denis de Derrida, French atheist philosopher. This argument is just a bold accusation against an entire class of people. In short, it's saying that God can't exist because those who claim to follow him and do his will are so sinful. The problem is it's an ad hominem argument, attacking a person rather than their claims. Now, if what Mr. Diderot is really saying here is, because these people are so wicked they have no right to tell me the truth about God, then I just don't see it. People have a right to know the truth, whether they like it or not. On top of that, I'd question his claim that philosophers have never killed priests. Philosophers kill people in the same way politicians do, by inciting people to violence. And many priests died from this as a result of poor philosophy during the French Revolution, the Communist Revolution, and so forth. Now I'll be skipping over a lot of atheism quotes, because many of them fall into this category, accusing the religious of misconduct or religion of being a bad thing for society. These are all ad hominem arguments, they're not logically valid. However, it's worth noting that all the major forms of education, hospital care, and scientific study, as they're honored today, were developed by the Catholic Church, so if you want to make a judgment on whether religion is good for society, you need to factor those things in. As for the claim that humanity somehow needs religion in order to do evil things, I think that's provably wrong, since the atheist regimes of the 20th century caused more death than in all the previous 19 combined. I cannot believe in a god who wants to be praised all the time. Frederick Nietzsche I searched through all of Nietzsche's arguments looking for something strong, and this seemed to be the strongest. Most of his arguments are either ad hominem, straw men, question begging, or setting up false alternatives, all of which are logical fallacies. However, he makes, or seems to make, a claim here that I find interesting. He seems to indicate that God's desire to be praised by humans is a form of egotism, and therefore proves God to be proud, and since pride is a vice, God can't be proud, and therefore can't wish to be worshipped or praised. The problem with this claim is that there are other reasons for wishing to be praised other than pride or greed. In God's case, his reason is that recognizing and praising his goodness is the best thing for us to do by our nature. He doesn't need praise, we need to give it. This is why we worship, not to feed some divine ego. There's also a popular claim now which I feel should be addressed. The accounts of Jesus' life can be disproved because they're clearly just an extension of previously existing myths about dying and resurrecting gods. We know this because Jewish history contained no predictions of anyone rising from the dead before the general resurrection at the end of the world. Therefore, the idea must have come from pagan sources. Wow! Where to start with this one? Firstly, it succumbs to the fallacy of false alternatives. It claims that the belief in the resurrection of Jesus had to come from either Jewish or pagan sources. However, there's a third alternative, that Jesus really did rise from the dead, and really was seen by his followers. If you start your argument by discounting this possibility, of course you'll wind up not arriving at it. But that doesn't prove anything. Secondly, they're right that the idea couldn't have come from Jewish sources, but how exactly would it have come from pagan sources? We're not talking about the modern world. The people of ancient Palestine didn't have the internet or ready access to all the surrounding cultures. How would they acquire this knowledge of other cultures? The only other major religious tradition in the region was the Romans, and their myths didn't include God's dying and being restored to life. You also have to take into account the fact that ancient Jerusalem was not only ignorant of the religions in other parts of the world, but almost militantly opposed to them. The very first commandment of their own religious tradition, which made up virtually their whole society and way of life, was, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. In other words, you shall not have false gods. The Jews considered the pagan mythologies abominations. Even if they'd somehow gotten word of a pagan myth or two and not rejected them out of hand, you still have to deal with the fact that there were many witnesses to the resurrected Jesus and their stories didn't conflict substantially. This isn't possible with a myth. However, ultimately the big problem with this idea is that it doesn't even begin to challenge any of the proofs for God's existence. The claims it makes are so far-fetched as to be virtually impossible on a purely historical basis alone, and yet, even if they were true, it still wouldn't prove that God didn't exist. 
Lastly, I thought I'd end with a quote by that atheist philosopher Bertrand Russell, in my view, the strongest argument he ever put forth in his life. The forms of zest are innumerable. Sherlock Holmes, it may be remembered, picked up a hat which he happened to find lying in the street. After looking at it for a moment, he remarked that its owner had come down in the world as the result of drink, and that his wife was no longer so fond of him as she used to be. Life could never be boring to a man to whom casual objects offered such a wealth of interest. Think of the different things that may be noticed in the course of a country walk. One man may be interested in the birds, another in the vegetation, another in the geology, another in the agriculture, and so on. Any one of these things is interesting, if it interests you, and other things being equal, the man who is interested in any one of them is better adapted to the world than the man who is not interested. The reason this argument is so strong is because it's true. If you take an interest in the things around you, you are more likely to be prepared to deal with them. However, you can be interested in things and still be detached from them, or be motivated more by higher things. And anyway, this argument could be made just as easily by a Christian as by an atheist. It's strong because, like argument six, it's not an argument for atheism. I'm sure there are some other arguments for atheism that I'm forgetting, but none of them were as strong as the ones I presented here. Most atheist arguments fall victim to straw man arguments, ad hominem arguments, question begging, or false alternatives, and there's simply no point in answering those arguments except by pointing that out when you see it. So, in order. The straw man argument is when you tear down a claim, implying that your opponent made that claim, but in fact they didn't. In other words, you lie about the position your opponent holds to make your own position look good. Ad hominem is when you attack your opponent, but not their claims. For example, Albert Einstein proposed the theory of relativity, but Albert Einstein had a stupid haircut, therefore his theory is invalid. This claim is silly because it's an ad hominem argument. Question begging is when you try to defend a claim by referring to the same claim as a premise. For example, premise one, it's part of the definition of God that he created the universe. Premise two, God is just an idea and therefore can't create the universe. Conclusion. Therefore, God doesn't exist. Yes, I have actually heard something like this recently. This is an example of question begging in action, because you can see that premise 2 already assumes that God doesn't exist. Therefore, the argument isn't strong. Lastly, false alternatives are when you set up two choices completely ignoring a third or fourth or more alternatives. For example, either the moon is made of cheese or else I'm a superhero. There are a lot more possibilities than those. Once you learn to recognize these common fallacies in atheist logic, you won't be fooled by these kinds of arguments again. That's all for now, so keep asking questions, and thanks for watching.